We are awakening together. This is our weekly gathering we hold online. For more information, visit our website, awakening-together.org. We'd love to see you there. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you on this wonderful Sunday. And um, I'm feeling character uncharacteristically calm, which is beautiful. So we'll see how, uh, how long that lasts. I'm going to read our um, purpose here at Awakening Together, and then I will um, highlight a core value that I've chosen that is um, within the, the message of the homily. So our purpose, we are an assembly of equals joined in common purpose, awakening to one true self. within an appearance of many faiths, many cultures, and many symbols. We seek to discern one truth and to rest in its embrace. And the core value that I have chosen um, is core value number four, and that is that we affirm one true self as the only truth. And we live this value by embracing what is helpful on the path of awakening without idolizing any spiritual doctrine as truth. Now we will move on to announcements. Let me pull those up. And we will move to our um, opening song, which kind of gave you a little coming attraction to. <clears throat> and... Uh, the last time I heard this, um, we'll, we'll just go right into it. That That's fine, Sina. I just, a little introduction. I just wanted to, um, I was prompted, and you have your own guidance, but to turn the volume up just a bit as you listen. And I often think of, when I'm listening to this song, I think of Cindy. So it's a shout out to her with her um I love us, how she says that. That's what this song reminds me of. I love us. So. Go for it, Sina. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, this uh, this uh, homily and recently my experience has all been kind of about shaking up some, shaking it up a little bit. So we're gonna do that, and I hope that that song kind of got everybody. I love the comment about the motor running. And now. We'll settle down to a little prayer. And I often choose this prayer. I call it my way of mastery prayer. When we're reading from way of mastery, it just, um, it's one of my favorites and it just sits well with me. And so I join, ask you to join me as we pray ourselves in to the morning. <clears throat> May Christ alone dwell within and as this creation I used to think of as Kelly or Jacqueline or Sina or Cindy or Billy. May Christ alone inform each thought, each choice, and each breath. May love direct each step. May love transform this journey through time that in time we may come to know the reality of eternity the sanctity of peace, the holiness of intimacy, the love and the joy of the Father prior to every breath and indeed prior to every thought that arises within the mind. 
Father, I give to you this time together. May we all have ears to hear, hearts open to the love that is ever present. For we are home. Home is what we are. Amen. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, Jane has agreed to do our reading. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate you so much. And it is from um, Way of Mastery. And if you guys are um, following in the big book, those of you that have it, um, it is lesson, it's from lesson 26. The um, lesson title is Allowing Purification, and this is a section within that. Um, and it starts on page 307. And the reading, um, this section is titled Allowing Purification to Occur. And that is going to be pretty much our topic is this idea of purification. So, Jane, you're on. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. The beautiful prayer. <laughs> I too feel remarkably calm, Kelly, this morning, which is funny that you said that. And I keep stopping myself from questioning, is something wrong? <laughs> nope. Okay. Allowing purification to occur. Allow purification to occur. Be willing to visit every dark corner of the mind. For in truth, it is not necessary to seek for love for love already embraces you, but it is necessary to seek for what is false. Where am I fooling myself? Where am I committed to my image in the world? Where am I committed to thinking for myself because underneath I do not truly trust that God loves me? Where am I lying to myself or others? Where am I in denial? Where do I need to understand what projection is? Where do I need to understand more deeply how the viciousness of the ego works within my own mind? Where am I pointing a finger outside of myself? Where am I denying myself? Sorry, where am I denying my fear? Where am I demanding that the world show up as I would have it, instead of surrendering to the structuring of the world in the hands of the Holy Spirit that serves entirely my healing, my growth, my maturing into true responsibility? Indeed, beloved friends, in the way of knowing, it is absolutely required that you pause often and look around you and say, I abide in the perfection of a loving universe. Nothing can occur by accident. Where I am in this moment must be the perfect place for me to be. How can I find the doorway to stillness within now? Where within me can I rest in peace and ask the Holy Spirit's guidance? Where in this moment am I clinging to another or a thing? Where am I looking upon another person or another thing in this universe and claiming it as claiming it is my possession? For what you do not give to be shared that you say you have loved, rest assured, beloved friend, in that moment you are in the viciousness of specialness. The egoic mind believes that if it shares what it has, it loses. Therefore, in your world, when you perceive that someone or something has brought you to a great source of comfort and love and even security, to see that being shared elsewhere activates the fear of loss within the ego. Much like many of you might remember that when you were teenagers and you began going with a certain boy or a certain girl in the seventh grade 
and then two weeks later, they decide to go with someone else. Oh, how crushing it was, for the source of your love had been stripped from you. Never will you enjoy the smell of a flower again. Never will food taste good again. There could surely be no one else in this entire universe that could provide you this great source of love and attention. Such is the immaturity of the child. Such is the immaturity of many children who live in 50-year-old bodies. For beloved friends, there is no one and no created thing, and the body-mind is just a created thing, that can be your source for love. Relationship was never meant to be a device for finding sources for love. Relationships were designed to be holy. In holy relationship, two have come together, not to get, but to create out of loving devotion to the grace that has awakened and purified their mind and hearts to the realization that only love is real. <clears throat> there is no such thing as loss and only love is worthy to be celebrated. In perfect love, there is no possessiveness. In perfect love, there is perfect allowing. In perfect love, guess what? There's not even you. There is only God loving through you. Therefore, indeed, beloved friends, look around your very home. Is there an object that you could not see yourself giving up? If you truly want to hasten your awakening, go and give it away. For in the end, all that you believe you possess must be given away. And what you believe you possess is the right to possessiveness, the right to be right. When all things created as a substitute for the reality of God have been rescinded or surrendered, then indeed the flower has emerged and the sweet fragrance blesses everyone. The awakened mind, the mind that rests in perfect knowledge, looks upon all things that it has previously loved and sees that their form is not what is essential. It is the essence or the content that they express that matter, that matters. A beautiful painting in and of itself means nothing. Hit it with a hammer, light a match to it, throw dirt and mud on it, and it is not the same. It is not the structure that matters. It is that in a timeless moment, you looked upon it, entered into relationship, and experienced the essence of beauty flowing through it. That essence or content is timeless. That essence or content is all around you. It sustains you. It breathes you. It is the heart of your heart, the soul of your soul, and the mind of your mind. Whenever you see any object, whether it be a body, a person, a mind, a thing, a flower, a pencil, it does not matter. When you feel what you call being in love evoked within you, it is because in that moment you have slipped between the cracks of the world of the egoic mind, the world of the egoic mind, and you are experiencing the essential content of reality, love. You are experiencing your own living true reality, for only love is real. When you come to see that love can be experienced at any moment, in any situation, with anyone, with any flower, you are experiencing true reality. When you say, well, I like roses, but I don't like gardenias, that is nonsense. Love is what you should love. Love is what you should assume responsibility for detecting as it flows through each living thing. And a rock, in this sense, is a living, a living thing. If it exists within it, you will find the good, the holy, and the beautiful. 
For only that which contains these things, which is the presence of God, can ever take form in the first place. Nothing can be without the essence of what you are seeking. When you understand that it is the content that matters and not the form, suffering begins to finally be alleviated. You can begin to embrace the comings and goings of this transitory realm of the dream as a dream. People enter your life and you embrace them and see the good, the holy, and the beautiful. They flow through their ever-changing changes and then they die. Now, death can occur not just at the death of the body. Death occurs at any moment in relationship when another changes their mind. They may decide to leave you. They may decide to awaken, which means that the being that you were relating to is dead. A death has occurred. Whether they leave you physically or not, that is really rather irrelevant. But when you come to attune yourself, to the essential thread of love that flows through all things, you are abiding in a deeper sense of knowing. Whether an object, person, place, or thing enters your life and stays, or whether it flows through in a moment, or whether it flows through over the course of a lifetime, begins to be less and less relevant to you, less and less do you grasp at it. Indeed, the mind that is truly awakened and rests in the eternality of love that is all things can lay the head of a loved one down, watch them take their last breath, feel a little wave of emotion pass through, that is the disengagement of the auric fields at a physical level, that is all it is, and let the little shudder of tears come through. You smile and say, oh, how sweet it was, how sweet it is, for love is eternal. And wherever two minds have joined in love, separation is absolutely impossible. So what's the big deal? And you allow something your world calls death to occur. Yet death is unreal to the mind that rests in the perfect peace of knowing. Beloved friends, you who have journeyed with me for longer than you would care to remember, it is always a journey of remembering and forgetting. That is what makes it your journey. You get a little glimpse or a taste of God. You tell the world that is what you want, but then right away you decide to forget it again so that you can experience the sweetness of seeking You have become addicted to being a seeker, and to seek, you must first cleverly push away what is always yours anyway, in order to embark on yet another journey of seeking. The end. Thanks, Kevin. So I I think I started in my um, description of this, I had found a a quote that um, I was reading online about purification and and it sounded so um, beautiful and simple and sweet and it was like if you were reading it you would say of course I want to do that why would I not want to engage in that process and um, you know just that idea that our essence who we are being only love that's who we are. And we have identified with a thousand things and said, oh, I'm that. I'm this. I am only this if I'm attached to that. I am only this if I have that. Um, I am only what you think I am. Um, I am only what I expect of me to be and all these other things have been added on from you know well, I mean we can talk they've been added on for you know lifetimes eons and even in this journey in this incarnation that I find myself right I 
just like it says, you know, I go through periods of remembering who I am. And then I cleverly forget because there's something in me that loves that rediscovery, right? And I think we've probably done that a few times. Um, I love coming back to um, the memory of who I am in truth. And that's always been one of my um, main aspirations is, you know, to remember, to remember God, to remember who I am. <clears throat> and so even having that desire um, to remember and live as I am in truth. <clears throat> One, I ask the question, why so resistant to this process of purification? And um, because, it, you know, I go through periods of times where I get so dang frustrated with myself that, you know, this again, right? I should be, you know, and all those, all those questions as we go through that. Um, I went looking, um, I was reminded of one of the first um, mentions for me that really caught my attention in um, NTI at, at within 500 days <clears throat> about resistance early on, you know, Luke is, is all about that. And it, there was this, um, it's Luke 11 from Luke 11 verses 29 through 32. And this is sentence 21, I believe. And it says your resistance is nothing more than your desire to keep things the same, to keep things as you see them now, and you desire this because you desire safety and you think there is safety in the security that you have made. And yet you fear yourself and what you have made also. So the point of resistance is that I, you know, within any structure of the day, any experience, um, something happens and we have ideas about how that should be unfolding. <clears throat> and, and in my case, I need it to unfold a particular way in order for me to be okay. So resistance says, eh, it's not going that way. It's not going the way I planned. It's not going the way I need it to. It's not going the way I want it to. So, so somehow I'm going to be able to put my, stop sign hand up here, right? And and reality is going to respond to me. Nope, this ain't going to happen. We're not doing that. Please listen to me. And the funny thing is, and also in NTI, we've been looking at, you know, really kind of looking at the thought processes within the ego and how truly absurd it is. I mean, we go about with these things and we really think it's given us good guidance. We think it's given us rational, you know, points of view and, you know, all this stuff. And we, we looked not too long ago about, um, you know, the idea of private thoughts, right? That we think we have these private thoughts and yet we're afraid that God knows what those thoughts are. Well, either they're private or they're not, right? And um, so obviously we don't believe that they're private because now we're terrified of God knowing our thoughts. So and just kind of pointing out the inconsistencies in the way we think and the way we operate. And so when I was reading this um, description of resistance, it's nothing more than your desire to keep things the same. And yet we hear about the um, in NTI, we hear about the. Um, you know, its version of the tiny mad idea, which is, I, what if things were different? I want things to be different. You know, I want a different experience. I want a different house. I want um, a different body. I want a different job or, you know, whatever that might be. So once again, we're really pretty inconsistent, even within our own structure, um, that resistance is saying, you say that, but that's really not what you want. You know, you want to be 
um, in charge. I am reminded of a, a quote from one of my favorite quotes, quotes from the course is, um, you who cannot control yourself should hardly aspire to control the universe. And that is, you know, oftentimes the story of my life. And, um, you know, so this idea of resistance truly is about, um, it's not about that I, I don't want things to change in my life. It's about the fact that I want to dictate all of those changes. I want to be in control of the change and in control of the experience. And when it seems to be going in a way that creates fear in me, I want to stop it in its tracks. And it's the arrogance of the ego within this one that engages a thousand different strategies that I think is going to work. Sometimes it's just you know, bail on the whole thing, right? Disassociate. It just ain't happening. I just will pretend that it's not happening. Um, and then, you know, try and manipulate the situation, try and control the situation, try and um, seek validation from others that, um, yes, this should be different. And I can find agreement along those lines, you know, fairly often. <clears throat> Don't have to look far. Um, sometimes we surround ourselves with people that will kind of validate that stuff. So um, the resistance, I've just come to see, is um, the way that the drama, the drama plays out in my life. That's what the resistance is. <clears throat> and it need not be, right? And that's where the pain comes, the resistance. Nothing that has happened in my life, and, you know, as I look back on, you know, my experiences and the ones that, you know, were what we would call big ticket items, you know, um, the loss of a loved one and way, and way of mastery, the reading talks about that. Um, so loss of a loved one, um, a period of time in my marriage when we separated and um, it was, you know, pretty painful. <clears throat> um, the, a recent issue at work that just really kicked, truly kicked my emotional ass. I mean, that's exactly what it did. And I'm still kind of reeling from that and coming back. So, um you know, in, in Buddhism, they talk about um, you want you have to watch out for the second arrow, right? So the first arrow, the first arrow that comes is is the event, right? It is the thing that kind of just shows up in our life. We're just kind of cruising along, and then all of a sudden, a circumstance, you know, shows up. That what I said could be the death of a loved one or whatever. <clears throat> or a, a separation or a job issue or health issue or whatever. So that's the, that's the first arrow. And, and in reality, if, as I look back, if I could truly practice, if I could, this is not necessarily in, I'm not saying this in a judgment way. I'm just saying it in a way of if I, had the presence of mind to practice and to allow that first arrow and to watch and see that arrow and to watch my reaction to that arrow and how that feels and what are my thoughts about it. In 500 days, we're doing this um, cognition, right? So we're looking at um, the being cognition versus the the dissonance cognition or decognition. Um, and so the first arrow comes and that's where you have the opportunity to see the, how am I going to view this experience? 
how, how am I going to be here with this now? Um, and we could feel it and we could see all the thoughts that come in. We can see all those ideas we have about ourselves. We can see all those ideas we have about somebody else. We can see all those ideas we have about how this thing needs to play out without buying into it. We could sit with that first arrow, actually pierce in our heart, be there and breathe with that arrow. But that's not typically how I respond, right? Then it's like in our incredibly powerful way, we're the ones that send all the additional arrows, right? So the thoughts come in about how I should be in this situation or the um, the things I need to watch out for in this situation. When I, when I look back at the relationship, when I had issues with um, my marriage, right? And that, that first arrow was simply a mention from my husband. We'd been married maybe three years. We'd been together 12 years and then decided to get married. And then within three years, we're having trouble, right? So that first arrow was, you know, him rethinking, you know, kind of wished we'd have just kept things the way they were, you know, not entered into this marriage, right? So there's that first arrow. Okay. And I remember being given the opportunity to just sit with that. You know, do you, do you feel that, Kelly? Do you see what that's, what that's doing to you? Can you sense the insecurity around that? Can you sense all the attachment you have to this idea of wife and marriage and all that stuff? I was given that opportunity, but I could not. I look back now, I could not sit with that, right? So I fire off a thousand other arrows, right? And it's those other arrows, like this could have been one of these and a little blip on a radar screen. And in my experience, it had to go like this. Oh, my goodness. It just went huge, right? It just became this whole drama. Um, and, you know, and, and then jealousy enters, right? And then every person he's talking to, I'm like, oh, see, that's why he doesn't want to be married, right? Because of that. He wishes he were free. He wishes he could do that. And it's all stories that I'm adding because in the sense of in the moment of crisis, we can't sit down and have a real conversation with anybody, right? We're too busy having a conversation with ourselves about the situation and watching all that stuff. So, um, you know, three months later, I'm packing my bags and I'm moving out and living in um, an apartment. and. Um, and many arrows came after that. And it, it probably was six months after I moved out before I could sit. I mean, really sit with all that that happened, right? <clears throat> so as I watched my resistance in the course of a day, um, I am beginning to see that I can practice, I really can practice on smaller things. There are a million opportunities within the course of a day to see how I resist um, and to see the first arrow and not to send myself a thousand more arrows along the way, right? I don't have to have these big, these big events like I just had at work and I'm, um, I'm like, you know, why do I need these things to get my attention? I, I'm still not quite sure, other than the fact that at some point in time, right, in my desire, my saying, I want to remember God. I want to um, remember who I am. I want to know myself as love, that in the sincerity in the moment, sometimes I, my aspirations are rote, right? I mean, sometimes I just go through the motions of, 
uh, bring into mind what I say I want or what I think I want. But there are times in my practice when I remember, truly remember what I want. And in those moments, right, the universe flip and conspires to bring experiences, situations into our life that is going to force us to go through this process. And I started this process in 1988. That was my first conscious awareness, having a spiritual experience that said, I want something different than this, right? I am tired of looking for love in all the wrong places. There has got to be another way. And I remember I mean, I remember those conscious, those conscious decisions and my life changed. Um, but I have put the brakes on this purification process for 35 years. And only when these big dramas happen, do I seem to be willing just out of necessity because I just can't stand the suffering anymore. Am I willing to slow down and really take a look and question what the resistance to it is? There's an event happening that you have called for, that you have asked for, because you want this, you want to remember who you truly are. And you put the hands up. You put, I want, never mind. I changed my mind, right? I, I pass, I, I'm tapping out, I can't pull it off this time. I wish I could, but I can't, because the emotion is more than I can handle. And, and I've done that off and on for a long time. And I, one of my contemplations in the last week or so was, um, it might have been further ago, it was just this idea of, you, you're just making it hard on yourself, Kelly. It just, you just make it hard. All the additional arrows you, you send your way is, you know, in, in recovery, there's a part in our literature that talks about, um, um, and I, and I think I've heard Regina in, in recent videos in, um, 500 days mention. You know, we don't have to go looking for these opportunities to purify, right? We don't. We don't have to, like I said, out of that, out of that desire, things will show up that will help us see what we've been hanging on to, what we're clinging to, what we think we need in order to be happy, etc. And there's a thing in literature that says, um, Avoid our recovery literature. Avoid then the deliberate manufacturing of misery, right? I mean, that's the, you know, just creating mountains out of molehill. You know, we avoid that. That's not necessary here. Avoid then the deliberate manufacturing of misery. But when trouble comes, cheerfully, says cheerfully capitalize upon it. I've, I've never quite gotten to that point, but I, I am moving towards at least being willing to recognize that if I want, if I truly want to heal, if I truly want to remember who I am, if I truly want these things, then recognize when trouble comes. That it is an opportunity. That is all. It is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity to see the stash of clinging. You know, what am I hanging on to? And to practice, again, not, it's the judgment. Man, it is just the judgment of the thing that I'm doing that is causing the pain. It really is not the thing itself. The first arrow stings. And that is life. And I was listening to something from Pema Chodron the other day, and she said, but it's ordinary, right? I mean, we, we continue to, because we 
are so busy trying to make the good thing happen and keep the bad thing at bay, right, that we have such a limited view of what's going on in our life. We see things as either good or bad. And so when trouble comes, right, it's, Pema says, that's ordinary life. First arrow, ordinary life. That shit happens, right? Can I avoid, though, all the extra arrows that I add to it? Can I, can I view first? I know I have to see. I have to see the dissonant. I have to see that cognition, um, deficiency cognition, right? I have to see how that plays out in my life. So as I can see it and I can let it go, then I can sit with this being cognition, which is what I'm saying that I desire more than anything. If I don't take that opportunity, it's just arrows upon arrows upon arrows. And then pretty soon I am so far beyond the initial upset that it is such a fishermen call it a rat's nest, right? When the, when the twine gets all messed up, you know, um, fishing line and they have to untangle it. I throw that shit away. My husband will untangle it line by line by line. I don't have to, um, I don't have to throw all the added stuff. I can see the history of added stuff. That's what the practice is. I can see how many times and for how many years what I have added. That will be shown to me. And if I can just sit in the grace long enough to watch that, to see that, then at some point in time, if I have faith and trust in the teachings that I keep showing up here for, which I do, then after time, they will decrease because I have not shot all the arrows. So that is, that's, I teach what I would learn. Please, Jesus, may I start to learn, please. That is my desire for me and for thee. And then I was reminded at, um, didn't even get back to this reading. Yeah, chatty, chatty. There is so much in there, but I do, um, before we go to our, song in NTI was reminded of what is at the other end of all this, right? And this the simple the simple description that has come to me for allowing purification is to allow purification just really does mean let's just allow the things to be as they are. And it sounds so simple. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but for this one, just to truly see what I'm asking for, to allow purification is to allow my husband to come up behind me and restack the dishes in the drainer. It drives me crazy. Why is not the way I put them in there? Okay. He thinks they will drain and dry better if he does it, right? So allowing purification is to allow that to happen, is to not have to make a comment about it, not even have to ask the question, not even have to confront him, but to remember in that moment who I am in reality and who he is in reality and all that deficiency cognition in that moment can be let go. And where we're headed, um, I read this recently in NTI, and this was like, this is what awaits for me on the other end of this purification process, right? This, this is from um, NTI, Luke chapter 23, towards the, um, 
end of this section. This is the voice of peace. It knows no conflict or attack. It seeks no guilt, and it gives the path no meaning born of artificial thought. That's all that, that's all second arrow stuff. This is the voice for God. It is a mighty voice that silences all other voices as meaningless and without purpose. This voice beckons to you in certainty and with authority. And then there's quotations, beckoning and the authority. I tell you the truth. Today you are with me in paradise. Beyond the illusion, there is truth. Truth is peace, and peace is paradise, because it knows only truth and listens only to the voice of truth. Lay mistaken thoughts aside and listen to me, and you lay crucifixion aside as purposeless, and you choose instead the purpose of realization of truth. That is what I want. All right. So that brings us to an end here. And I'm going to ask Sina to play once again. Turn up the volume. This is kind of shaking things up a little bit. Let, let's do this thing. All right. I love you. And... Uh, Sina, play for us. Take him off. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Jane for reading again. And thank you all for being here. And we have a little bit of time. If somebody wants to share before we move into... Um, fellowship or our closing song. If not, we can just go to the close and then we will go to fellowship. Peter. Oh, you hear me? Hear yes. you. Good morning, Kelly. Thank you so Good much morning. for sharing what, what, what is, what is happening in you. And, uh, that we are love is is the message I think that I taste in what you said. Oh man, I wanna I wanna find that, and I think it's our true true will what God share with us. I wanna share actually with you what what came up for me. The word there was the the, the, the retreat that was the retreat uh, embodying true and about peace and that we deny peace. But we are peace. And I think, oh, you know what? I'm going to look the word of deny in the course of miracles. And the third hit was, you are only love. And that's, that, that's, that's, that's a fact. It's, 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 it's written there as a fact. You are only love. But when you deny this, you made what you are something you must learn. I think, oh man, I just deny a fact. It's not that I work into, to become something, but I deny a fact, a fact that I am love, and then I have learned who I am. And we know also from the course, we cannot learn what love is, but we can learn what we are, is that is he's saying. And you know, if we just accept or or no, not just ask, accept, it, it is actually more the fact is a fact. I am love. And from there off, we can experience what. I don't know what to say more about it. It's, I only want to say, wow, I'm so happy that by the four hits, I saw you are only love. And that the denying, my denying, uh, is actually have to be faced without judgment or whatever. It, it, it's just what, what, what we did. But we are love. That's a fact. There's not a work that we have to become love. But it is actually to, to uh, it feels for me sometimes to work, let it be done. Let it be done. And that gives more relief for me. So thank you so much for this message because we all are, um, what, what, how can I, a good word for that? We are all 
uh, searching for that. We are all searching for that, that we are so, we are so loved. And it's not difficult to see that in you, Kelly. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Right. Well, I hope you all will stick around for fellowship if you feel the need. Um, and love you all. Thanks again for being here. Have a great Sunday. been watching our online gathering. It happens weekly on Sundays at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time. To join us live in the sanctuary, visit our website awakening-together.org. You'll want to click on online sanctuary in the main menu and then in the drop-down menu look for how to enter the sanctuary. Right there at the top of the page is a clickable link. We'd love to see you in the sanctuary and join with you in fellowship. Thank you again for watching. Also, please know that if you'd like to stay connected via the Awakening Together channel here on YouTube, you can subscribe and hit the bell for more notifications. We hope to see you in the sanctuary.